Alrighty, folks, we're here on uh, the Shanker Road for a very special episode of the, the Made to Parade podcast. We're having a wee bit of a culture day today, and we're joined by a number of different musicians who are performing on the road. One of the heritages that we're kind of exploring is the whole idea of the Lambeck drum, and I have a, a special guest with me today to talk a wee bit about the heritage and the history of that particular instrument. You're very welcome with us. Do you want to introduce yourself for the listeners? How are you doing, Glenn? My name's Willie Hill. I'm a retired music teacher. I taught for 35 years post-primary school. I've always had an interest in bands of all different sorts, but my main band would have been a brass band. But since I was about six or seven, I always had an interest in the big drums. My grandfather was the original master of the local Orange Lodge, and that sort of came from there. You know, the, the drums were always about, you know, you probably worked out I'm not from Belfast with my accent. <laughs> I'm rising from Balamone, and there's always a great drumming community around Balamone, it still is. Uh, but I've always had that interest, and I sort of dropped out of it when I left here to go to college. Um, but about 15, 16 years ago, a friend of mine says, he says, do you ever think of taking up with drumming again? Ach, I says, I don't know what I've He says, come up some night and have a tune with us. And then they say, the rest of says history after that, you know. So I've been back into drumming again about sort of 16, maybe 17 years ago now. Um, love it, I must admit it. And now when you go back, it's like, it's like a disease. Like we're, <laughs> like we're here today to do this wee thing for you. Kyle, it's long we're here. We'll be going to the drum and match tonight up in Killeen, you know. Yeah. So once we start, uh, like obviously COVID last year, there was no drum and matches at all. But once we start end of March, that's us through every Saturday night, maybe the old Friday too. We maybe the sort of end of September and begin October time. So it's six months of the year, you know, you're, you're going to a match somewhere. But I mean, the, 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 whole, the, the heritage and culture of the, the Lamb Bank drum, I mean, people have a misconception, you know, that this is a noise. It's not a noise, it's a musical instrument. You know, you have to think back when King William arrived here with his army. I mean, how did he get here? They didn't they just didn't dander up, you know, they had some sort of music to keep them going. I mean, fifes and drums, and like big instruments like that there, they, we think they came along with his army, his mercenary army, um, from the continent to Europe, and they've been used as a signal for war, you know, battle signals, things like that there, along with trumpets and, and all sorts of drums as well. So, but, but the, cor- the, the culture and the heritage that we're trying to preserve as you know, that as a musical instrument, you know, it's not just somebody standing battering the living daylights out of, you know, to annoy people uh-huh. or be triumphant in any any way at all. You know, as whenever you hear it being played along with a fife, you'll realise, oh, this is actually a musical instrument. Sure. You know, and that's what we're trying to do. I mean, there's like Kyle and I are both members of the Carrick Drumming Club, but there's there's wee clubs coming up around the country everywhere, and they're they're trying to preserve that that heritage and that culture and make young feel you know young people aware of you know this is music, this is part of our culture, you know, and as well as that folk think, oh well, they're, they're orange drums. They're not orange drums. They're drums. End of story. They're associated with the Orange Order, the 12th of July, the Loyal Orders. But I mean, up until 30 years ago, the Hibernians used them. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to think back 150 years ago. You were having a demonstration, a celebration. What music had you? You know, silver bands. You might have had a pipe band if you were really lucky. Maybe a flute band. But the majority of things would have been fifes and drums, you know. The, uh, the Royal Black Berserk, still have drums. Now, the only ones we can't find are ones belonging to the Apprentice Boys. Right. But I'm sure there's ones about the country somewhere. But, I mean, all the Loyal Orders have them. The Ancient Order of the Burnings would have used them. The Masonic Order, they have drums lying around the country ever. They have one fancy one sitting in, in Grand Lodge in Dublin, you know. So it's not just the Orange Order. It's any organisation who wanted to parade. What do you use these here? You know, so it's not sectarian in any way. You know, people have tried to do that. But no, I mean, I go into schools and, and tell Wayne's about this, you know, and the majority of them are going, what? Oh, Hibernians, what are they? You know, mm-hmm. once you explain, they'll sort of go, I thought it was Orange Drum. You know, so it's a different kettle of fish. Sure. Why do you think it's important to preserve this particular aspect of culture and heritage? Well, put it this way, Glenn. If you went to the Midlands in England, would you see a Lambeg drum? Would you hear a Lambeg drum? No. Would you go to America? There's one in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, but you're not going to get them anywhere else. So if it dies out here, that's it. You know, it's an indigenous instrument. You know, there's nowhere else. There's maybe a couple in Scotland, you know, but you'll never see or hear them anywhere else. So we have to keep that culture alive. And it's through the likes of the drumming clubs, you know, Junior Orange Order. You know, you create an interest and say, right, you know, this is part of your culture. You need to keep this alive. We're going to pass this on to you. And that's why I enjoy so much about doing what I'm doing now. You know, going into communities and saying, look, here, this is your culture. Don't let it die. You know, that's that's the way we have to make the young fellas and young girls actually. I mean, we've quite a few girls and the drumming club who are as good as the boys. In fact, if I go into schools, I'll tell the girls, you know, you're actually a better drummer than the boys, because girls, for some unknown reason, have 
a natural rhythmic thing that boys don't seem to have. They just okay. want to make noise. Uh -huh. Whereas girls, they'll maybe think, very be careful what I say, more analytically here. Say, oh no, we can do this. Oh, we know how that fits, you know. And that's the way it works with them, you know. Uh -huh. And is there a particular reason, obviously you have a fife with you today, and is there a particular reason why the fife and the, bar, the long bag drum go together? I mean, that is probably one of the most primitive instruments you'll get. Six holes, one at the top to blow in. You know, and people will say, that wee thing there, how on earth do you hear that above that? But that's so high-pitched. And you've got to remember the sound of the drum goes out the way. So the drummer actually doesn't really hear the full sound of the drum. But that there, that carries up over the top of the drum. So we can hear that without any bother because it is so high pitched. You know, and to keep that going, that is part of the heritage as well. I mean, that was what would have gone with that there. I mean, if you think to the east coast of America and all the colonial bands that are there, the Lake of Middlesex County Volunteers, the old guard, they all use that there. Yeah. And if you listen to their drumming style, I am convinced that it came from here because they use those big wide open rolls that we use on those drums here, mm -hmm. you know, and like the old skeleton drums that they use around sort of like South London area, that style of drumming, and they're very much interlinked with lamb bag drumming. So I mean, that's why we use this here a lot, not only for the sound of it, because it's, it's a historical thing as well. Yeah. It's come from three or four hundred years ago. So that's why you use face and drums together. Yeah. I could definitely see that connection. I've had some of the guys from the old guard on mm -hmm. the podcast with me and I'm actually have uh, Mark uh, uh, Mark Reilly's been on with yeah. us, yep, and also uh Billy White. Yeah. has been on with us too and then we have Jim Clark coming on from the Connecticut uh -huh. um, Field Valley yeah. um, guys are coming on and you can definitely hear oh, the influence yeah. right across the border what's the his or what's the future of the lamp egg drum from your perspective well fortunately the Ulster Scots Agency have a big push on this year obviously for centenary and they have commissioned eight drums to be made and painted with the centenary badge on the front of them so they're trying to promote the culture as well they're putting the like of me into schools to promote the culture as well. And you, know, if I always say, you know, if there's a hundred Wayans and we get four of them who become drummers, you know, you tick the box. That's the culture still going on. You know, it's difficult to sort of convince youngsters nowadays that this is, you know, this is music. You know, but once they get into here, I mean, I come into school for 10, 11 weeks, and they'll go, no, I, I, I know where this is. I know where this is going. I can do some of this, you know. And there's actually, would you believe it or not, a qualification in lamb bag really? drumming okay. through Open College Network, right. OCN, a level three qualification in lamb bag drumming. So once the Wayans finish their wee thing, and they do all their wee workbooks, and they do their questionnaires, it's like a wee exam. They'll get their certificate with a, 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 an accredited qualification from OCN and lamb bag drumming. Where else would you get that in the world now? <laughs> so the future's looking reasonably bright then? Oh, I'd say it is. You know, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of wee drumming clubs, I said earlier, you know, up around the country, you know, encouraging youngsters to come forward and learn to drum. You know, like, the age group in our club there, you, you have people of, of a certain age, let's say, like, you know, <clears throat> my age, and then you have... Uh, we well, went there maybe come 10 or 11. Uh -huh. You see, we have a big, big age group there. And you know, somewhere in the middle, you know, there's a few as well. But we have a big age group. We have maybe 16, 17 members. And like up round Carrick, there's, there's two or three other drumming clubs as well. Same sort of membership, you know. And we try to get out into the community. Like we, 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 the Royal Landon didn't happen this year, but we still have the opportunity to go down to Carrick Castle, drum a few wee tunes, just there at Nip Fortnite with, with a nice day. Uh, and there was good crowds about, you know, where people come out, oh, let's have a go, let's have a go. And you say, well, you give them a basic rhythm, I mean, try this way, and they realise that's maybe not just as easy as you think. You know, so we, we, we've, we've sort of got across into the community that way, you know, it's difficult, but it's worthwhile. And hopefully we'll, we, we'll, we'll pick up a couple of members, you just don't know. You, you cross your fingers, it's like everything else, like any sort of band, you know, it's like, I mean, you were in the Raven for years, you sort of go on, practice to start up again, are we going to get any new members this year, you know, what's the crack, you know. So it's a wee bit like that, but I'd say, no, the future's bright. Okay. Well, listen, we're, we're, we're down to hear you play some stuff here. So, folks, how about we listen in to some of the music coming from the Long Beg Drum here on Connor's Corner on the Shackle Road on the Maria de podcast.
Folks, you're still with us here on the Me at the Parade podcast on the special cultural event on the Shagger Road here. And I am joined today by another musician who's going to be playing the accordion for us in a wee minute. But we're going to do a wee interview here, find out a wee bit how they got involved with playing the accordion and what role that plays in their lives now. Do you want to introduce yourself for the listeners? Hello, my name is Liz Hagen and I've been playing in band practically all my life from when I was at school. No worries, Liz. Great. How did that actually, how did you end up getting a start? Where did the interest come from? I've always been musically minded, but all my uncles and my grandfather and my great grandparents were all in bands and some played pipes and my two brothers actually started off, one was four and one was seven in a band, so I was quite late, I was about 13, right, okay. you know, and I always wanted to play the accordion, right. so there was a girl lived across the road, was in a band, and I asked her for the lend of hers and just taught myself quite a lot of tunes before the learners class actually started. Right. So how did you go about that teaching yourself thing? Was it just trial and error? No, what actually happened was I borrowed her accordion and the learners class didn't start to September, but I got it in the summer and I had three or four tunes learnt and went into the band practice thinking I was great. And the guy said to me, he taught music all his life and he, he was the type he'd load of met, load of medals. He's played on the, the world stage and that, the guy that taught me and he knows all about music. And he says, I've been trying to do that for years and I could never do it. I had it on upside down. So I was actually playing Sorry. it left-handed. So I learned all these tunes upside, the wrong way round. Right. And he couldn't figure out how I did it. So so you then had to go through a process of relearning then? Okay, yeah. there on. And what was that like? What was he like as a teacher? Well, when I first joined, it was actually not like today's bands. It was actually 80 in the learners class. Right. And I was about 13, 14. By the time I was 15, I was teaching small groups. And by the time I was 16, I was teaching bigger groups in the band. So if it's in you and you really love music, you've got that enthusiasm to keep going. So yeah, it was easy for me, right, really. Okay. Do you remember your first parade? Yes, the first parade's terrible because <laughs> <laughs> it's all right sitting learning and it's all right walking. But when you have to march, keep time and keep the actual notes in your head, it's very, very hard. And then if there's tunes you don't know, you're trying to watch everybody else in front of you. Because it's easy to dummy on a flute, but it's not easy to do it with an accordion. Because right. people can see that it's not going the same. But yeah. Sure. And Difficult. yeah, the band was so big, they didn't actually have enough uniforms for all of us. So some people went, because they wore navy blue, I had to borrow navy blue jumpers off kids that went to a different school for me right, okay. and, and go out. So yeah. yeah and you're still involved in a band today then? Yes, well, I never really stopped playing. What happened was the wee band, the Blue Star I was in, actually fell away because uh, people's not playing the accordion now the same. All right, they're heavy and it can give you a bad back. And in Belfast, because the parade's so long, I think that's why they fell away. We're down the country, they've loads of them. Mm. So we found it harder and harder to get members. So we ended up just playing around old people's homes uh, at Christmas, a lot of them on the shankle here. And until it ended up, there was just three or four of us and we gave it up, but I still did a lot of things for the British Legion and the likes of the Orange Order where I would take it to, on the 1st of July and play at the psalm at their wee service for them or I'm in a wee psalm society called the Friends of the Fallen and people that had bought forward members of their family graves that maybe were buried in France and Belgium and they'd never seen before, so we done a wee service and I maybe took me accordion and played a couple of hymns at the graveside and then the women's group on, in the act here down the road said that they were going to learn an instrument and everybody, when I came up to show them the accordion and, and a few notes of how to play it, everybody took to it right away and so then they had people coming in that were of my age group that maybe hadn't played for years and all they needed was a bit of confidence so the wee band, the Shankle Protestant Girls as they're called, took off more or less overnight and it's still going and they're all still very eager and enthusiastic. Brilliant. So you're doing your own wee bit to try and keep the, the accordion alive on the Shackle Road, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, doing Brilliant. the best. Great. <laughs> it's good to keep that heritage, though, especially if you know it's something potentially under threat. And you know, because obviously flute bands are the most dominant kind of you know uh, band on the road. It's, but it's good to keep that tradition alive, and it's great to hear that, that someone else is, is helping people do that. You're going to give us a few tunes, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> All right. What are you going to play for us? I'm going to play. It's a long way to Tipperary and to pack up your troubles. It's like a wee melody out of. I put together myself last night, so I hope it's not perfect. <laughs> no worries. Well, listen, folks, we're going to get a wee demonstration here from Liz on the accordion. Liz, over to you.
Folks, you're still with us here on the Made to Pray podcast on our cultural event on the Shanka Road here. I am joined by Francis, a paper, and you're actually the very first paper that's been on the Made to Pray podcast, so absolutely brilliant to have that. Maybe you can kind of introduce yourselves for the listeners and tell us, how did you end up getting involved in paping? Well, I started when I was 11 years of age. I was a friend at school. His father run the pipe on out where I was from, Raffrey Pipe On, and started went down to the bomb practices and started by taught me was John Garrett and uh, just began from there and I just played on through until I was about 21 and then there was a flute band started out uh, Red Hand Defenders and Down Patrick so I actually gave the piping up for 10 years and went and played my cousin started the band and it's still going to this day so I played for 10 years the flute but the love for the pipes was there all along so I went back to piping What was that learning process like? Because obviously you know you're a young lad you're walking into a room full of people you don't know and then you're trying to pick up this instrument what was that actually like? Well at the start it was quite nerve wracking it's six months before you actually get a tune on the pipes Mm -hmm. if you're being taught the exercises and all the movements so it was quite daunting every week we got a different exercise you went away and learnt it and then came back and if you could play it you got the next movement and there was loads of movements and exercises but it was it was four or five of us from the same age so it wasn't too bad So was there a wee bit of competition between you and the guys that were learning to see who could get ahead the most? Well, secretly, yes, <laughs> secretly, everybody wanted to do do well, but uh, we all were sort of at a level, and it was quite good, but I remember the first night I got the pipes, uh, the, there was a hole in the bag, and I couldn't, I couldn't get a note out of them, <laughs> and everybody else seemed to be getting, making a good effort on Very it, cool like, uh, and I was going, and then the, the, John said to me, he said, I hope you're not going to be one of these pansy blowers, he says, <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up... Uh, I said, will you try and blow them? So when he tried it, there was a hole in the bag, so it wasn't a matter who was playing them. Brilliant. But it was daunting enough learning yeah. now. I'm sure, and you don't actually learn with the pipes straight away, so you don't no. you learn with, the, is it the canter you start off with first? Yep. So we practice chanter, it's the same nine notes as the, the big chanter, but obviously for learning tunes and all, you start off on the practice chanter. And what was your first parade with the pipes like? It was the Battle of Somme parade, actually, in Killale. I remember that year, Raffrey was just sort of struggling with membership and there was this, the four new learners and there was three older men there and we played up to the castle in Killale and we played the, I remember playing the Battle of the Somme, the tune called the Battle of the Somme, it was very poignant, you know. Yes. Very, um, how did you find marching and stuff for the first time, all good? It wasn't too bad, actually, right. I didn't mind it too bad, uh, it was just the fact that you were out in it was great, it was great. What would you say you've got positively from being a member of a pipe band or just playing the pipes in general? Oh, I've, out of playing bagpipes, I've, uh, it's unbelievable. I've been, to, I've been all over the world. I've been to South Africa, Germany, Canada, you know, playing at tattoos and things. I've also... Um, member of the Pipes and Drums and two Royal Irish as well so okay. with it we do a lot of support in one Royal Irish and the tattoos and things And but I basically make my living now through playing the bagpipes and it's it wasn't what I'd planned in life but it's the way it's turned out right, uh, So it's fair to say the pipes have been good to you? Very good to me I love them it was last night it was I was out in the Hinch with a, the local Ballin the Hinch flute pros and boys flute band mm-hmm. and they always have me laying a wreath. They're laying a wreath and I'm playing the lament. As they, so I do a lot of events, do a lot of memorial f- events, you know, over through the year, you know, up, up in this part of the world quite a bit. Yeah. Any significance with your tartan on today? Well, funny you should say, that tartan is the help for heroes. I bought that, every kilt that you buy from the help for heroes, the, the charity gets a hundred pounds. To, to the charity so I, I always felt that you know put a wee bit back in and, and I had it I like the tart and I like the kilt you know mm-hmm. so you're going to play a few tunes for us today what are you going to do for us well I'll play a couple of wee marches they'll be known to everybody the listeners hopefully and uh, take it from there 
Brilliant, Austin. Thank you very much for taking time to be part of the podcast. And we're looking very much to hear you here as well. So, folks, enjoy the page from Francis. By lonely prison walls, sure I heard a young man calling. Nothing matters, Mary, when you're free. Against the famine and the crown, I rebel, they put me down. Now you must raise our child with dignity. All free birds fly. Our love was on the wing. We had dreams and songs to sing. It's so lonely round the fields of Athens, right? By lonely harbor wall, she watched the last star falling as that prison ship. Sealed out against the sky. So she'll hope and she'll pray for her love in Botany Bay. It's so lonely round the fields of acid grind. Lonely the fields of acid grind. Where once we watched small free 
birds fly Our love was on the wing We had dreams and songs to sing It's so lonely round the fields of as and ride the fields of bound the fire where once we watched the small free birds fly our love was on the wing we had dreams and songs to sing it's so lonely round the fields of as and it's so lonely round the fields of Bath and Rye. Oh, it's so lonely round the fields of Bath and Rye. Folks are still with us on the Made to Pray podcast here in the Shaka Road at a recultural event here. Joined today by Jackie. Jackie, we're doing a few songs on the road here. What was that all about? How do you get involved in terms of doing that type of stuff? Uh, way back about 2000, we were doing some stuff on the shangle with a group of kids from Alternatives and uh, trying to help them celebrate their culture without getting into all the uh, uh, anger and uh, uh, fighting with it. So we, we had a look to see if there was any singers and songwriters and whatnot on the shangle. And there, there's only maybe one or two who wrote poems, but no real singers, songwriters. So we started uh, getting them together way back then and we, we pulled the thing together called the Shankle Time Machine. And uh, all those kids got involved. We wrote a lot of songs uh, based on the culture of the Shankle. Uh, and uh, it went down a treat way back in, in those days, but it sort of died to death, you know. And uh, then the guys from Alternatives rang me and said, look, do you fancy doing some more of those songs today? So that's, that's how I ended up being here in it, you know. And did you do any of the songs that come out of that session today in your set? Yes, uh, probably five or six on that session today were from that set. They obviously just need to pass the legs. <laughs> so, so did you do any of those songs in, in your set today? Yeah, five or six of the songs we did today were songs that we wrote for that set because in the time machine that we, uh, the play that we wrote, the musical drama that we wrote, it. Uh, I went back to the beginnings of the Shankle, where, you know, before we had Protestants and Catholics, you know, and uh, how the Shankle started, how the Shankle evolved, and then we, we looked at different stages. One of the main things on the Shankle here would be the First World War, the Battle of the Somme, so we looked at that. We looked at the whole thing with the Orange Order and some of the songs relating to the Orange Order. So it was really to try and help them celebrate their culture without having a violent side to it, you know, because music, you know, mu music can unite, music can also hurt and divide, you know. And we were trying to give voice to the young people, you know. And one of the things we did, we we had sat down a lambeg drum, and we sat down a flute, and we sat down a boron and a tin whistle, and we said, which one's Catholic, which one's Protestant? So straight away they went for the lambeg drum and the flute and said, that's Protestant, and the boron and tin whistle were Catholic. So we took the boron and tin whistle and we started playing Protestant tunes on that. And we says, is that Catholic? And they said, no. And we took the uh, lamb, egg and flute and started playing some Republican tunes on that and says, is that Protestant? No. I says, well, when those instruments were made, they weren't made sectarian or racist, you know? Uh, it's who's blowing through them that makes that racist or sectarian sound. So we were saying to them, you need, you need to find your own voice and not have other people blow through you. You need to know who you are, you know? And it worked, worked for us, you know? And have you a favourite song that came out of that session? Uh, there's one there which is uh, uh, Come Now is the Time to Worship and it's, it's sort of based on uh, Patrick coming down from Slamish, coming over the hills, possibly coming down the Shankill Road and forming the old church on the Shankill. Uh, Sean Keel is the old church and this was the, this was the Antrim Road before it was the, the Shankill Road and up at the graveyard up there is where the old church was formed on the banks of the Farset River, you know. So, but for me, because of its historic value and the content of it relating to the tribes, but there, there were two tribes here at that time called the Ulid and the Cruthen. But like today, you've got the Catholic and the Protestant, two tribes, you know. And Patrick came along and he set up the church and he put out a, a call to worship and he rang his bell. 
and they came from Divis and they came from Black Mountain and then they came to a place called the Shankill, which was the old church, and it's still here today. You know? And is there a personal connection with that song as well then? Pers- uh, personally, because of the, the history that I you know uh, uh, off the Shankill, and I like history. I came from the Shankill Road, I also, uh, my heart would be that uh, the Shankill Road would return to worship, that it would walk away from the paramilitaries, it would walk away from the troubles, it would walk away from the sectarianism and everything else, and it would, it would be a, a some, somewhere where they could build again. One of the songs in, in the set today was, uh, uh, we're going to build the road again. And that one is, is calling those who have left us to come back and help us build again. You know, we're all getting old, we haven't got much time left, you know, and we need uh, uh, sensible, good heads back on the road, businessmen to invest in the road. We need those here in America and Canada to come back and sow, the diaspora who are scattered around the place, to come back and sow back into uh, the Shankill Road, to, to make it something great again. It's lost its way, it's lost its father figures, and the Bible says that uh, in the last days God would turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, and the hearts of the children back to the fathers again. And the Shankill Road needs some fathers. Yeah. Brilliant. One of the last things I wanted to ask you about there was, you said that the, the, the project that you were doing around writing new songs and stuff like that there kind of came to a natural end. Is there something in you would like to do that again? I would like to, I would like to uh, rekindle the old play because it, it was supposed to go to South Africa at that time, it was supposed to go to the States, but what happened was the funding dried up. You know, and then I got involved more in the church and sort of I'm involved in the church and my, most of my time's in the church. So I, I hadn't got time to to research that myself. Plus I'm getting older, I don't know if I've got, I might, I might have one more shot at it, <laughs> no, before I leave the planet. But I'd like to give some of the young people on the road an opportunity to to be songwriters themselves and poets themselves, you know. Brilliant, well, maybe that's something we can help out with all made to pray, that would be great, because I know that's something I've been really interested in doing, is trying to bring people together to write new songs, write new pieces of music, you know, and, and share something that's positive about their culture and their history that, that isn't draped in what the negative. It's not, thre- it's not threatening the other community, you know, we, we, took, we took that song, The Size, and we put that other tune to it, and we went and we did some stuff in, in Twinbrook, and we did uh, uh, Fila FN, during the flaw, we sang them on that. There are fair play to them. They opened up the door and let us sing them, and, and uh, there's nobody offended by it because once you took that blood and thunder out of it, you know it's just a song about somebody leaving here and coming back again and looking for a, a welcome, a welcome back. So we have a tendency to politicize everything over here, and you know what's black to me is white to somebody, and and somewhere along the line it needs to change. You know we can't keep going on and going on and going on the same old. My father's war is my war, you know, my father's war, he, it was his father's war and his grand, you know, it's down through the years, it's got to stop somewhere and hopefully in this generation it can stop. Well, listen, thank you, thank you very much for being a part of the event today and also for taking time. I really appreciate that. Thanks for the opportunity. Brilliant. Thank you, Knight. Cheers, Knight. All right. Well, there you go, folks. That's us um, for today. We've spent a wee bit of time on the Shanker Road, sharing a wee bit about the culture and the heritage of the road, and also sharing some of the musical traditions and getting a wee bit of an insight into some people's stories as to why they've got involved with this particular type of music. We hope you enjoy the episode. Make sure you join us on the next one. So until then, look after yourselves and take it easy.